Well, hello, and welcome to the first in what will be an occasional series of video podcasts, video casts, I guess you'd call them, with me, Daryl W. Bullock, talking about the kind of music I write about and the kind of music I listen to. Every February here in the UK, we celebrate LGBTQ History Month. So, for this inaugural cast, what better than to introduce you to a classic of LGBTQ music, one of the greatest camp records of all time. It's the Brothers Butch and KY. For LGBTQ people, and especially for gay men, the summer of 1967 offered much promise. The new Sexual Offences Act had just been passed, meaning that homosexuality, well, homosexual acts between two consenting adult males aged over 21, in the privacy of their own home at least, was no longer a criminal offence, and the atmosphere was filled with a palpable sense of change for good. Love was indeed in the air. The Beatles told a global television audience that it was all we needed, and it felt like the world believed them. As the summer of love turned first into autumn and then winter, a strange little record issued by a tiny London-based independent label appeared. Very few copies were sold, but it has gone on to become one of the most sought after and highly cherished examples of a typically camp British humour. Its origins have been debated in books, online and in academic papers. But for more than half a century, no one knew the true identities of the musicians behind the disc, with their beetly ooze and camp archness. Credited on the picture sleeve correctly to the Brothers Butch, but on the disc itself to the Butch Brothers, the innuendo-laden KY, titled, if you did not already know, after the leading band of water-based lubricant to KY Jelly, was apparently penned by one Eileen Dover, a wonderfully silly pseudonym that would befit many a drag queen. All double entendres and limp wrists, KY was not the first queer pop record, but it was one of the earliest and most blatant to be issued here in the UK. It appeared just a few months after Maverick producer Joe Meek and his band The Tornadoes issued their final single, Is That A Ship I Hear, which featured as its B-side, Do You Come Here Often?, a tune with a spoken middle eight with a wink-wink reference to trolling the dilly. Do You Come Here Often was the first British pop song to include Polari, gay slang, used to such great comic effect by Hugh Paddock and Kenneth Williams as Julian and Sandy in the hugely popular BBC radio show Round the Horn. Oh George, isn't it nice having a group back in us? You always were greedy, Clara. Oh, I can't see- Say the right thing, can I? So why don't you shut your face and take this best to see? Oh, really? I don't know why I agreed oh, to I don't, come along here. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know. If you're sure. Kay, why don't you bring out the best in me? Why did you have to make a mess of me? Why did you slip through my fingers? Put my love in a freeze When all I gave you was a little squeeze Why did you slip through my fingers? Ooh Won't you come again and meet me outside the tube The way we used to do Can't we get to the bottom? I feel wrong since you left me I just can't get through Be nice to me You're like a piece of jelly ice to me Oh tell me please, K.Y. Isn't this the bit where you have your great big moment, George? Well, I've been building up for it, Clara. It's the whole night. Well, make sure you're sitting nice and comfortable. My hands are getting all clammy. I think I'm nervous. Just take your time, Doc. Don't worry. Oh, no. It's all right. You're really? coming now, is it? Shh. Now, go and go. Oh, 
Oh, that was groovy, real groovy. Won't you come again and meet me outside the tube the way we used to do? Can't we get to the bottom? I feel rotten since you left me. I just can't get through. You're like a piece of jelly ice to me Oh please tell me K.Y. There it is George, it didn't hurt a bit now, did it? Not really, but then of course the group makes a big difference, doesn't it? Oh, it's George and we're very fortunate to have a group behind Ah, oh, yes, I can't say different. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, why say look? Right. Don't you think that drummer's got a very wild look in his eyes? that drummer. Oh, wow. Give him the Oscar. Yes. Oh, look, I'm a bit worried now. Give him look. Oh, what's he doing now? Oh, oh, oh. Do you think he's been on something? Oh, that's a completely not finish. But who were the brothers Butch? And who was Eileen Dover? The disc was the only release from Thrust Records, based at 494 Harrow Road, London. Now a flat above a fast food takeaway, at the time it was also the address of iMark Records, a tiny independent record label that had previously issued I Got You by Sheila and Mal, a Sonny and Cher parody from actors Sheila Hancock and Malcolm Taylor, and the album Recycles Are a Drag, by legendary dragball organiser Mr. Gene Fredericks. But they were probably best known for their Railway Arna productions, a series of field recordings of train sounds. iMark was set up by Mark Edwards, a former BBC cameraman who was moving into music video production, and Malcolm Taylor, an actor, stage director and acting coach. Taylor also ran an employment agency, Domestics Unlimited, providing work for resting actors and musicians. One of the musicians he was finding work for was Eric Francis, singer with a four-piece psychedelic rock group from Fulham, The Purple Barrier. It was through Taylor that Francis met Edwards and introduced him to the rest of the group. Edwards quickly became the band's booking agent and de facto manager. The Purple Barrier recorded one unreleased single for iMark before, in 1968, changing their name to The Barrier, to avoid any confusion with Deep Purple, friends from the same part of London. In the spring of 68, The Barrier issued their first single, Georgie Brown. With his connections, Mark Edwards was able to get The Barrier included in a pilot of her new BBC pop show, featuring Julie Felix and had them slated to perform the title song for a film starring Terry Thomas and Phyllis Diller, called The Pubs of London. Georgie Brown did well enough for Phillips to sign the band, with iMark and Mark Edwards staying on as producer. As well as running his label, Edwards was also working on a music video project for TV broadcast, filming acts associated with songwriters Ken Howard and Alan Blakely, including Dave D, Dozy, Beaky McIntitch and, and The Herd. Howard and Blakely were also involved with iMark, writing Uh, the A-side of The Barrier's second single, as well as the follow-up The Tide Is Turning. Their distinguished, decades-long careers include two number ones, Have I the Right for The Honeycombs, and The Legend of Xanadu for Dave D, Dozy, Beaky, Mick and Ditch, for which Edwards and Francis shot the promotional film. Sadly, neither Ken nor Alan was involved in the writing or production of KY. Ken Howard and Alan Blakely may not have been involved, but Eric Francis, lead singer, occasional fire eater, and one of the principal songwriters for that purple barrier was. Eric explains that it was the barrier who provided the instrumental backing for KY. At the time of recording, we had no idea that what it was for, other than the fact it was for a comedy record, he recalled. Mark Edwards was responsible for the production and distribution, but he had nothing to do with the writing or performing on it. Howard and Blakely, although they were connected with us as a band, had nothing to do with it either. The Barrier performed on the instrumental track for KY, but were not involved with the vocal, and after finishing the session, they were off to Europe on tour. So who wrote the songs and performed vocal duties on the disc? 
KY was written and performed by Roy Cowan and Ian Carr, a songwriting duo who performed as Goldberg and Solomon, a comedic take on Gilbert and Sullivan. Ian Carr was born in Edinburgh, although he was brought up in New Zealand, returning to the UK in 1961 with his cabaret partner Daphne Barker. Not long afterwards, while performing at a London nightclub, Ian met Roy Cowan, born in Hampstead, who had trained to be a rabbi, but discovered his knack for writing parodies of hit songs while serving in the army. The budding song satirist, who had previously written lyrics for Charles Aznavour, amongst others, impressed Carr with his on-the-spot parody of Moon River, entitled Chopped Liver, and an immediate and lasting partnership was formed. The pair wrote songs for Carr's nightclub act, as well as for other artists. Cowan wrote the lyrics for the huge international hit A Walk in the Black Forest. But perhaps the most bizarre commission came from tractor manufacturer Massey Ferguson, who had the pair compose a full opera for the company, staged in a cornfield in Greece in front of sales delegates from around the world. We met Mark Edwards and Malcolm Taylor at a recording session, Ian Carr told me. They liked what we were doing and asked if we had anything else. I said, well, we've got this song called KY, but we need a backing group. And that's how we got the Purple Barrier. The band were very good, very professional, and Mark and Malcolm both liked KY, so we let them get on with it and didn't ask questions. With no promotion, sales of KY were tiny, but it was for their unique take on Victorian light operetta, Gilbert and Sullivan Go Kosher, that Cowan and Carr would achieve international fame. As Goldberg and Solomon, the pair recorded their first album for Edwards and I Mark, the same year as the brothers' butch tracks were laid down. The Tailors of Poznanz, subtitled The Best of Goldberg and Solomon Volume 2, there was no Volume 1 incidentally, featured actress Miriam Carlin, star of the hit TV show The Rag Trade, who Carr had coached for her role in the hit stage musical Fiddler on the Roof. Incidentally, Ian Carr was also involved in another iMark released around the same time, a very rare record which is called QPR The Greatest, performed by the Queen's Park Rangers footballer Mark Lazarus. The flip side features what is probably the most peculiar psychedelic football anthem ever recorded, a song called Supporters Support Us, of which, says Eric Francis, I have heard it suggested many times that it may be something to do with us but not guilty. A third barrier single, again produced by R. Mark for Phillips, was issued when the company demanded a follow-up to the Howard and Blakely song, Uh. The pair produced The Tide Is Turning, a track from the latest Dave D. Dozy Beaky McIntitch album, and Edwards provided the B-side, A Place In Your Heart. But although the barrier recorded the vocals, none of the band actually played on the disc. The tracks were laid down while we were on tour in Germany, Francis explains. We came back and we were told, this is your next single. By 1970, iMark was no more, but by that time, Edwards had already moved on. He hit his peak as a producer that year, with Curved Air's debut album, Air Conditioning. At the same time, Eric Francis managed to score a number one hit in Japan, with the band Capricorn and Liverpool Hello!, but apart from the occasional session, including one for soul singer Doris Troy, then signed to the Beatles' Apple label, that would be his last shot at stardom. Five years after KY was recorded, an advert appeared in Gay News. Have a thrust for Christmas, it announced, before promoting the record, albeit with the sides flipped, making the more seasonal I'm Not Going Camping This Winter the plug track. <laughs> Come on, George, is that supposed to be my introduction? Yes, what'd you expect? The mass in B minor. Oh, come on now, no need to be nasty, I only ask. Oh, get on with it. Can't you see the red light song? Oh, where? Oh, are they recording us already? Yes, now get on with the song. All right, now. I'm not camping out this winter. No, I'm not camping out, I'm afraid. My mummy has said I must early to bed. And what's more important, I must learn a trade. I used to love going out camping, cause camping can really be gay. I remember those nights that I spent on the moor. The air on the G-string was ever so pure. 
For whatever ailed me, I soon found the cure, but I'm not camping out anymore. Oh, George, you are playing a bit fast, really. I'm just talking. No, just take a little bit slow. Right. Just a little bit. Grumble, grumble. I'm not camping out this winter. Come on, I'm not camping out with my friend. Cos Cecil's been told that he's got to take hold of himself, if you please. What an end. We used to go down by the river, then grope our way home in the dark. We'd often pick pansies, and some we'd take back to dear cousin Arthur, who lived in a shack. One bathroom, one bedroom, and one plastic mat. No, I'm not camping out anymore. Now watch it, this is when I change the key. Oh, will it take long? Not unless rigor mortis sets in. There now. Oh, thank you. I'm not camping out this winter, although I am still pleasure bent. Cos tramping for hours through the valleys of flowers in the rain, will it won't pay the rent. I used to go picking roses and berries, but somehow I can't anymore. Cos munching on wild fruit can make you feel sick. I plucked wild rose and I felt such a prick. If you don't believe me, ask Harry and Dick. No, I'm not camping out anymore. Oh, I'm getting out of breath again, George. Really, I am. I'm not surprised the way you've been carrying on lately. This song is definitely not you. Oh, you're just jealous because you're only playing the piano, aren't you? I'll smack you if you're not Thank careful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now then, get on with it. All right. I'm not going camping this winter. The whole thing has gone far too far. So have you. Such very strange people one happens to meet, all reading their poetry and in their bare feet. Now the hippies are having their lovings, and you can't tell the girls from the boys. Mm. I wish they would stay in their own village halls, instead of parading and making love calls, and wandering around all tinkling their bells. Oh, I'm not camping out anymore, because I'm choosy. I'm not camping out anymore. Oh, am I glad that's over. And so am I. It's the last time I'm backing you. Oh, is that a threat or a promise? You can take it any way you like. Oh, thanks for nothing. You've just ruined my recording, day, boo. <sighs> Oh, I don't know what to make of you. Then, a few years ago, a peculiar digital release turned up on Amazon and iTunes. Coupling both sides of KY, along with a very similar sounding The Girls in the Band and Bald, a pastiche of The Age of Aquarius, the hit song from the free love musical Hair. This MP3 EP also included three other songs, one of which was Waltzing with Hilda, from Cowan and Carr's mid-70s review, Slightly Jewish and Madly Gay. Credited to the Daisy Chain duo, Ian Carr now admits that the performers are indeed Cowan and himself. Roy and I went to see the boys in the band, and I had coached Oliver Tobias for his role in Hair. The girls in the band and board had been earmarked for a second Brothers Butch single, but this did not materialise. During the decade following the recording of KY, Goldberg and Solomon recorded three further albums and toured the world. The curtain fell on their highly successful act when Roy Cowan died of a heart attack aged just 54 in Sydney in June 1978. Carr returned to work in London. For 25 years, he was resident pianist and evening host at the Mayfair Hotel in the heart of the West End playing in front of celebrities including Bob Hope, Sammy Davis Jr., Sir Peter Usnoff, Dame Edna Everidge and Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Ian became close friends with musician and educator Anne Rashlin, playing for her Fun With Music sessions, where children, including Princes William and Harry, were introduced to classical music. Ian and Anne performed all over the UK, although his playing career came to an end after he was diagnosed with Parkinson's around a dozen years ago. He and Anne moved in together, and it was Anne's loving care and friendship which slowed his deterioration. Sadly, Anne's own passing in November of last year presaged the swift decline, and Ian died in care on the 21st of January 2024. KY appeared at a time when LGBTQ people in Britain were beginning to find their voice. It may not have changed the world, but despite its commercial failure, it is an important footnote in the history of LGBTQ music. We were aware, says Carr, that we were sticking our oars out and making a few ripples. If only he could have known that those ripples would soon become waves. (laughs) 